Good morning. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about Hello World, um, which is a deceptively simple program. Um, it is, you know, it is um, as this slide shows, the first example in Kerrigan and Ritchie's the C programming language. It's on the first page. You know, it's about the simplest thing you could do, or so you might think. Um, <laughs> it turns out, actually, that talking to several people who have implemented languages and runtimes, that printf is usually the last part of the language you implement because it requires all of the rest of the language. And in fact, a slightly more complicated version of Hello World that I'll show you shortly is essentially a complete test suite for C. <laughs> um, so here, here again is the first example. Um, so, well, to start with, we have to correct it a little bit because it turns out the example in K and R is not valid C in any modern C dialect. So we had to add a couple of void statements. Um, but um, so, so, that, so that's, a, that's a bit of an interesting thing. Um, to get all the way to the, to the uh, example I'm going to use today, I'm going to add a couple more things and slightly complicate matters. Um, so what, I, what I've done here is I've added a, a static string rather than just having a printf so that we're actually using the Veridac arguments functions of printf. Um, which is one of those horrible features that no language should ever have, at least not one with a register-based calling convention. But, you know, all modern architectures do this, and this is one of the reasons why printf is really a test suite. Um, before that, though, let's talk about a, the minimal version of printf, um, this, or of, of hello world. This is the smallest thing you could write in C that emits, that emits the string. Um, it uses the write system call um, and just splats it out by length. And then it calls exit, which is also a system call. Um, it's very simple, very straightforward. Um, and you might think that it would turn into a piece of assembly code much like this. Um, don't worry, if you don't know assembly, this is the last you'll see in this talk. Uh, <laughs> um, but. Uh, it is very, very simple. So we, we load the one argument into the first argument register. We look up the address of the string hello. Um, we load it into the second argument register. We load the length uh, incorrectly um, into the uh, third argument register. We load the system call number into the system call argument register, and we trigger a system call trap. This goes into the kernel. The kernel does its thing. It writes, reads the data. It writes it out, magic happens. Um, and then we return, and we do basically the same thing again, except that we load the return value of zero and the system call number for exit. And that's it. Um, this is, in fact, um, the, the compiler DLA is a pseudo instruction, so it actually does two whole instructions um, <laughs> when it's expanded. Um, but really, this is it. So you might think that's what happens. Um, but in fact, the minimal C version is about a half megabyte stripped. <laughs> um, it turns out that this is mostly malloc and localization, despite the fact that you're not using either of those features. Um, so you might wonder why that happened. You know, how did we get all this stuff in a program that doesn't use any memory management functionality at all? Well, for some hints at that, let's look at program linkage. So here's how you might link a simple program where you have an object file and you want to turn it into an executable. Um, most programmers probably know that, um, that this links in the C standard library. That's expected. But what you might not know is here's the actual link command, quite simplified, um, <laughs> um, that's generated by the compiler. I've removed all the quoting and I've removed I've simplified the paths, and I've chopped a few things out that weren't interesting. Um, but uh, you notice all these little object files. These, these are linked in this order because they contain initialization code. So um, here, here's the list of them again in a more sorted order. Um, so CRT1, this is, this is the beginning of all things. It contains the, the underscore underscore start function, which is the thing that actually gets run first in any sort of conventional POSIX C program. 
Um, the name doesn't matter, but by convention, that's always the name. Um, and its job is to set up the environment that C expects and then call main. Um, in fo following that, there is the, uh, there, there's CRTI. CRTI's job is to ensure, is to call a number of initializers um, and set, also set up um, some uh, um, destructors. Um, the things that it sets up are horrible. Um, just a genuinely terrible idea. So there's, there's these in underscore init and underscore fine functions. Um, what appears in CRTI is some assembly um, for a function entry for each of these in a different section. Then any random object file that's linked later on could contain some other machine code, which is concatenated together. Hopefully everything goes right and uh, no one misaligns the stack on the way through. Um, no one corrupts the state of the stack um, in other ways um, and all that. And then way at the end, CRTN adds some return from that function. And now again, hopefully everything went well. All that's just sort of mushed together by the linker to create some functions. Um, it's lovely. Um, then there's CRT begin. There's three different versions in FreeBSD. Um, they just differ in what kind of linkage you're doing and they're compiled slightly differently, but they all do the same thing. They, allow, they support yet another kind of constructor. Um, these are C++, Ctor, Dtor um, constructors. They're another set of sections. These are at least halfway sane. Um, in that they are in fact a section which contains an array of function pointers. So you just call the functions and that makes, that makes sense um, and is fairly reasonable. Um, and in addition to declaring those arrays, they declare some functions to actually call what's in them. So that's, so the, the layout of the arrays is not part of the ABI in this case. Um, so again, CRTN terminates those. They need to be null terminated. So each program might contain a bunch of function pointers, or each object might contain a bunch of function pointers um, that get put into these arrays and then they're terminated. So that, that's fine. Um, and there's actually two more kinds of uh, constructor and destructor that we'll get to later. Um, and these are where all this stuff gets pulled in. We're gonna do a walk through the code, um, or through the execution, a little bit of the code, mostly just looking at the stack, and I'll talk about what various things do. Um, and, and along the way, I'll show you where we hit all these things and why stuff gets pulled in that you wouldn't expect. Um, a quick um, note, most of the rest of my slides are going to be screen caps of zoomable F SVGs. Um, if you look at this URL, either one, they both go to the same place. Um, you can see the actual SVGs and so you can explore on your own if you want to. Um, these were generated by um, taking an instruction trace out of Kiyomu, doing a bunch of processing with awk, um, and then feeding that into a slightly hacked version of Brendan Gregg's flame graph program um, so that you can see stacks. I think it's kind of a neat visualization. Um, I wouldn't want to try it on a really complicated program, um, but as you see, it's kind of a neat way to look at things. So we're gonna start not in printf itself, but in the kernel um, at the sys exec ve call. Um, exec VE's job is to take an existing process and replace all of its contents with whatever program you want to run. Um, in this case, hello world. So let's take a look here. Um, the first thing we get um, is, in, in exec VE is exec VE copy in args. Its job is to allocate some memory um, and then copy in the program path and the other arguments that were Passed, is passed by reference to the exec VE system call. It's not very exciting, but um, it is one of, the, one of the first things that's involved in setting up the, the uh, exec call. The next thing we're gonna look at is current exec VE. This is the actual implementation of exec VE, and it's used by all the different system call ABIs in FreeBSD. So if you call a Linux binary, it does a bit of work to deal with linux -iness, and then calls current exec VE to actually execute the process. So the first thing that happens in current exec VE is it looks up the path that you've passed. Um, I'm not gonna go into details because I don't understand name I. Um, <laughs> but it's magic, it, you give it a path, it finds it. 
Uh, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as George has been telling me all week, names are an illusion, so we don't, we don't want to know anyway. <laughs> um, next part is a little function um, which checks the permissions of the file, make sure it's executable by the user who owns the process. It seems like a good thing. Um, and as a side effect, opens the file. Um, then exec map first page does what you might expect. Um, it maps the first page of the program so that it can examine the header and other parts and other um, things, other image activators can look at that header and say, is this mine, is this, is this the, something I can run? Then we get into the meat of things. Um, so this is, this trace is on a 64-bit MIPS machine, um, mostly because that's where I've been doing all my work um, and because I have nice instruction level tracing. Um, so on there, the first image activator we find is the one we want, which is the 64-bit ELF execution environment, or image, image activator. Um, and it, so it's, it's going to try and load, um, load the program, get memory set up for it, um, and then set up registers so it can return into the program. So the first function we get is exec new namespace. Um, its job is to, or uh, new VM space, sorry. Um, its job is to set up the uh, memory mapping of the process in the initial state. Um, first thing it does is it deletes all the, all the pages from the memory mapping. Um, because it doesn't care about whatever the contents were from the previous process that forked. The next thing is that it maps a stack um, into the address space. Um, this was something that actually surprised me a little. Um, I, I had expected that stacks might be, might be placed on a per, um, per system call interface basis, but in fact, they're always called, they're always set up here. Um, they can move around, um, so Linux could put, the system, could put the stack in a different place, but in practice, looking at the system, it's always the same on every architecture in FreeBSD, which is a little surprising. So now we have a stack and an otherwise empty address space. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna load some sections into, mem into memory. So a typical simple statically linked program, which is what we're talking about, um, has two sections in the file. There's the text section, um, which is the executable bit of code, so it's all the instructions and some other non-instruction things, but it's basically all the instructions that will be executed. And then there's the data section. Um, the data section is all the static, all the static data, all the dynamic values, uh, or all, all the global variables, um, all the initialization values for various things. And then there's BSS, which is all the global and static variables that default to zero. Um, and so those aren't in the file, that saves space, um, but those pages are mapped at the same time. So back into current exec VE, um, the next step is exec copy out <laughs> strings. Um, this is a bit of an oddity, it's actually Despite the fact that we're on MIPS, it does a bunch of things according to the SCO i3d6 ABI, um, which happens to define how every ELF executable, which is the standard file format on every Unix anyone cares about, um, except Mac OS. Um, <laughs> um, so it defines how the process is laid out and where to find things. So for instance, where to find the argument vector, um, where to find the environment vector, and I'll get, get to the, uh, how, the, how this is laid out. But what's interesting is it's actually just plopped on top of the stack. Um, and why? Historical reasons. Um, but uh, it's, it was a, it's an interesting thing there. Um, and then finally, there is exec set reg. Exec set regs, its job is to set up the registers in the, in the trap frame so that when the system call returns, it's as though it returns to where the start pro process is with the right arguments. And I'll talk about what those arguments are um, when I get to, uh, get to start. So here we are, we've returned back from current exec v, we go to sys exec v, and we get the standard system call return path, which is out of scope today. Um, and we return to user space. 
So the recap, at this point, the stack is mapped um, into the address space. The program is mapped into the address space. Um, and, a bunch, and a bunch of strings and whatnot are, are set up. And then finally, the register state is set up to call um, the start function. So now, to talk a bit about what's on the stack. Um, there's a whole bunch of things. Their order is very strict, is in, is in part strictly defined and in part loosely defined. Um, the top is PS strings. It is used by the debugger, um, and it points and by programs like PS um, to find pro program names that are too long. Um, it's not, doesn't appear to actually be necessary in modern software, but we're stuck with it for existing ABIs. Um, another oddity, SIG code is where signals returned, where signal handlers return to so that they can jump back into the kernel. Um, and for some reason, we decided to put it here um, long, long ago. And then there's a bunch of strings, there's the stack canary, there's some arrays of things. Um, those are accessed um, by the elf auxiliary arguments, um, by the environments array, or via argv. Um, so, and the finally, the last thing at the bottom of the top set of the stack is the argument count. Um, so this is all the things that you need to pass to main um, in order to run a program with, with standard arguments. Um, one oddity here is argc in C is defined as an integer, um, but in the uh, ABI it's a long so that it's always pointer aligned. <laughs> and so that stack alignment is preserved. So lots of weird history here. Um, and so I, I would say what I forgot to tell you in the introduction is the reason that I'm here is that I, um, and, and looking at all these things and finding all this history is that I'm in the process of writing a new ABI for a memory safe variant of C with hardware enforcement. So it turns out all this history and all these odd things that you know, you, you just know you can find them at the top of the stack, for instance, that's not okay if you want memory safety. Um, so we have to take these, all these assumptions, find them, tear them apart. So here we are. Um, so you end up with the stack pointer at the top of the stack. Additionally, the first argument to start is also that stack pointer. Um, and it's used for things, I go into this again, but it's used to magically find things on the stack. So this layout is all part of the application binary interface. And it's part of how the process works. So now, we're, now let's get into start. Um, which you, one thing you might observe um, looking at this is that um, most, of the, uh, most of the arguments have these JE, or most of the functions have JE something under them. That's because, in fact, this program spends almost all of its time in malloc. Um, like something like 90%, 95% of cycles in Hello World are spent in malloc. So part of that, so most of that is because J malloc is a malloc designed to support giant multi-threaded programs. You know, it, one of the optimization test cases in the first case was Firefox. Um, these days it is whatever Facebook's PHP workload looks like. Um, so it, it is a big heavyweight um, implementation designed for real problems. So, you know, it doesn't really matter. Hello World's not a performant thing. You know, you don't really care. Um, how long it takes. But it's interesting that there's all this overhead. Um, and in fact, for some program, if you wanted a trivial program like this to be super fast, you would definitely want to use a simple malloc. Um, and actually, one of the things we found in our research is we were using a trivial malloc in some of our benchmarking. We realized we were doing a lot better than we should be. There should have been more overhead compared to the unmodified uh, uh, environment. It turned out, oh right, we hadn't turned JE malloc on yet. Uh, so we made that change in our tree recently. Um, so let's take a look at start. I've, I've condensed start onto two slides by stripping out all the bits about all the, the uh, conditional cases for dynamic programming and, or uh, dynamic libraries and all the uh, conditionals for um, profiling. Um, so it's just the minimal thing. So first up, we're, uh, we're setting up the argument vector. So we have AP, which as you recall is that pointer to the top of the stack. Um, we know that that is in fact a pointer to argc. Um, so we, we, we get argc out of there. 
And then we say, oh, well, we know the next thing. That's argv. Um, and then we know that the environment is just past that plus a null pointer. Um, um, and we, and we by argc. Um, and we'll get later, you know, in a moment to an even more bizarre um, example of finding things on the stack. Um, the next thing that we do is there's this function handle argv. Um, its job is to set the environment, the, the environ uh, variable, so it sets it to the pointer to the argument array, um, and it sets the program name variable. It's kind of a minimal thing. Next up is init TLS. So this is, this is in fact why that example program with just write was so bloated. Um, it turns out that we need to set up thread local storage and we do this unconditionally. Um, we need to do it in all cases because we don't know whether or not we'll be threaded. So in, in a static program, we probably could avoid it. But in a dynamic program, we must always set up TLS because we might load a library later um, that uses um, um, that uses threads. So we need to have thread local storage set up. Um, so for those who don't know, thread local storage is global or static variables which are per thread. So each thread has its own copy of that variable. Um, you know, again, unsurprisingly, most of the time here is spent in malloc. Um, so let's, let's talk about what an init TLS does. So the first thing it does is it finds the elf auxiliary arguments vector. It does that um, by this cute bit of code, which is it takes the environment array, and it knows that the environment array is null terminated, and it knows the elf auxiliary arguments vector is just past it. So it walks right off the end of the array <laughs> on purpose, <laughs> and then it says, oh, that's the elf auxiliary arguments vector. Good, I'll just cast it, use it. It's great. <laughs> um, so it uses that to find the program headers. So one of the many things in the elf auxiliary arguments, in addition to things like the stack canary um, and the array of page sizes and whatnot, is a pointer to the mapped in program's program headers. So that's the thing that tells you what all the sections are in the program in the program's binary. Um, it uses that to find the PLT TLS section. Um, this section contains the default values for all of the TLS variables that aren't zero by default. So you might have a, you might have a TLS variable that's one um, because you want to do something, you know, you want a condition to be true. That will be stored in here. And that's the beginning of the TLS section is all those things. So that can just be splattered right over the top. Um, once it has that information and it's stored it so each thread can use it in the future, um, it calls this libc allocate TLS. Um, which allocates space and initializes values as necessary. Um, and this is where JE malloc comes in. So it needs to allocate space, and that space needs to be freeable later um, by calling free because you might start another thread and kill the original one. So you can't just leak that, and you, you don't want to have to record that Eh, maybe I'll replace, you know, you don't want to record that this one's special in some way. So what happens is there's a special interface into JE malloc which doesn't use thread local storage um, and which does all the initialization bits, um, but it avoids all the things that haven't been set up yet because, as I said, JE malloc is designed for a threaded environment, so of course it needs per thread pools of storage and whatnot, um, so it makes use of TLS. Um, and finally, um, the TLS pointer is set um, on a per-thread basis. Um, on MIPS, this is calling a special sysarc syscall, which says set the TLS pointer to this value. Um, and then when you want to use it, you call the syscall again, um, usually via a, a, an instruction that traps, um, that generates a trap, um, um, because it's typically unimplemented. Um, and you, you get the value back. Um, in Cherry BSD, we actually have implemented a, an optimization. So we, so we call the syscall to set the value, but then we set a user local register, which is a special register readable by the, uh, uh, by the program, or readable from user space. Sure. Yes? I think that's the first time you mentioned the name Cherry before. Oh, sure. Um, so so Cherry, be, Cherry is, our, is our processor with memory safe extensions. Um, 
And Cherry BSD is our fork of FreeBSD. I talked about it last year. Um, so I think there's probably a talk online if you're interested. Um, it is basic, so it, it adds bounds checked pointers. Um, so we can do all the things that ASLR and, uh, and, and control flow integrity, except we can do them enforced in hardware um, and fast. Um, um, so, yeah, so we, we've implemented some optimizations. That one we could probably merge back to FreeBSD. I think it works on the edge router light, so we probably should. So back to, um, back to start again. Um, we've, we've initialized TLS, um, and now we get into um, static, handle static init. Um, I'm not gonna go dive deep into the code because it is a chain of boring and hard to read code. Um, but and it basically, this is where all the initial, all the constructors are called and where destructors are registered. So as I said earlier, there are four different kinds um, because people added them at different times and wanted different things. So init and fine were the first things um, historically. Then I believe um, init array was added next. Um, so that's an array of function pointers. That's the bottom one that runs last. Um, and it's called, it's a sensible interface, more or less. Um, and then I, I assume that people decided, oh, but we need to run some things early. Um, you know, some library setup stuff that might be called by other initializers. So we got pre init array, um, just, you know, because why, why, why not, why have a consistent and sensible interface when you can have something dumb? Um, <laughs> Uh, actually, what, what, what's, really go, what's really going on here is it's hard to get all the world to change their linker um, and to add new features to all the linkers in the world. So therefore, you have to write something that works with the old cruddy linker you have, not the new shiny linker you would like to have. And then you encode it into the ABI as is done here. You make it part of all the standard interfaces, and then you're stuck with it forever and ever. Um, I think we can kill init and fine. Um, we're doing it in CherryBSD. We're going to see what happens. <laughs> uh, uh, and there's also this, uh, the uh, C++ constructors, the CTORs section. Um, and that's weirdly in FreeBSD, I think actually due to a GNU thing, called through init. And that's the only thing that gets called through init. Um, that's a trivial fix, but I haven't done it. Um, in any case, all, what all these do is they call a bunch of, is it essentially they call a bunch of functions um, which, which set various things up. Um, the thing that actually matters here is that um, in the process, the destructor, um, the finalized destructor, which calls um, fine and which calls, um, there's a fine array um, at exit um, gets set up. And then finally, we're ready to call main. Um, in FreeBSD is start, that is main and whatever main returns gets passed to exit and the exit system call gets run. So we'll get into main now. Um, okay, so here it is. Let's see, and I can barely read it. Um, <laughs> so again, you know, it is mostly malloc. Um, so, and in fact, although it is also mostly VF printf, um, VF printf is called by printf um, down here, and then VF printf um, starts doing some work. So the first thing it does is it has to get the locale, um, which is how it can look up things like which decimal point is used. Um, and we'll get, to, we'll get to the, that is in fact the, the reason it's used um, in this case. But get locale is a bit of, has a bit of interesting machinery to it. Um, so locales are per thread because you might want to write a server where one person connected is in a country where the, the uh, Decimal separator is a comma and another in a, one in a period. I don't understand exactly why you would want to structure your application this way, but this is, in fact, a, uh, something you do. So locales are per thread. Um, so we look up the locale, and then we call this once function, which is an interesting, interesting bit of machinery. Its job is, as you might expect, to do something once, um, either once per thread or once per execution. Um, so you can look up a value, and then you can save it. If, and. and uh, so what, it, what it's doing here is it's trying to find the locale path. It looks at the environment, tries to find the path. In the end, it's not set in the environment, so it uses the default. 
Um, so all that work to copy a string. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's very general. <laughs> uh, and that's, that's one of the, the amusing things about looking through printf, is printf is trying to solve, is, is you, as, as you walk through all this code, it's trying to solve the whole big problem, and that's why it's such a big beast to make two system calls. Um, so back into VF printf. Now let's look at underscore VF printf. Underscore VF printf, um, we get here by passing the locale that we got before to VF printf L, which takes an explicit locale, and then we call VF printf, which does all the actual work of uh, printing a string. So. I'm going to ignore all the stuff on this side because what this is, is it calls into the file object for, st for uh, standard out and it looks at it and says, oh, you're, an out you're a buffered file and you don't have a buffer yet. I guess I better allocate one. Um, and so that's what all this code is, um, is, is basically allocating an array. Um, so, and I'm not, I don't, don't have time to get into jmalloc, so we won't do that. Um, now, this is the part that's kind of, that, that's the actual meat of printing. Um, first, and this was a bit of a surprise and I think needs to be optimized out, printf, no matter what it's printing, what, what's passed to it, always spends a bit of time here finding out what the decimal point is on entry. Because, um, you know, you might print a floating point number, so you should look that up. Um, next. Um, is, is, a very, is a fairly simple thing. As you recall, the string that we were parsing was a, was a percent %s space percent %d slash n. So a string, a number, and a, uh, and, a, and a bit of white space. So the way vfprintf works is for each block of data up to a format code, it, uh, it assembles a, a buffer of things to print out and then flushes those out at the end. So in this case, it first finds the percent %s string format. Um, so it puts that and the string in. It, uh, in here, it looks up the, uh, the length of the string, sets that in the buffer. Um, here, it adds a little bit that says, okay, there's gonna be a space, and then it says, oh, there's gonna be a number, and it calls this function whose name, I can't quite remember, um, whose job it is to write, to, a, to write out the representation of the uh, integer string. One thing that's, that I found was interesting when I was reading this code and modifying it for some other reasons is it actually works backwards. So it starts at the end of the buffer, uh, of, the, of the temporary buffer, and writes, so it writes the first digit, or the, the, the least significant digit, the next, the next, the next, which is an easy way to do it. And I thought, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then I stumbled across three other implementations of printf in the tree, all of which do it the other way. <laughs> uh, in fact, we have at least four implementations of printf in the tree. Um, the runtime linker has its own, libc has its own, there's one in the kernel, and there's I think one in the bootloader, and I'm pretty sure there's some more. Oh right, jmalloc has one too. Uh, <laughs> because printf, as you've, as you've noticed, uses malloc, and jmalloc wanted to have a printf so they could print debugging information, and then you know, deadlock is bad, so, um, so there's a copy of printf in there. Um, and then we finally get to the last bit, so there's the, the uh, new line at the end, and we'll zoom in on that because that's where the actual write system call goes. So we, we have this single, single buffer to be written out. Um, at the beginning, when it's scanning the buffers, it first copies them all into one place, and then it looks at them and says, it scans them all and says, oh, is there a new line anywhere in this output? Because if there's a new line and it's a buffered file descriptor, then we need to actually call write when we hit that new line. Um, so it finds the new line, which means that um, this f flush call gets made later. f flush in turn um, does a bunch of things, digs down, digs down, digs down. And finally, we write the string. So there we are. <laughs> now, that's the basic static hello world. Um, I said in my, uh, abstract that I would do dynamic hello world. Um, so I will talk a little bit about dynamic hello world. Um, unfortunately, I was assuming that I would have finished modifying the runtime linker for our, uh, our project um, to support our new, our new ABI um, 
and it being a software project, I didn't get it done in time, so I don't actually understand runtime <laughs> linking yet. <laughs> uh, but I understand the basics, so I'll give you a quick tour of it. Oops, wait, I'm sorry. I am not there yet. I have one more tiny bit. We're back into, we've returned from main, we're back into start. We get to exit. Um, and exit isn't actually call the system call directly. Um, it's a little more complicated than that. Inside exit is a function, its job is to call destructors. So this, uh, uh, this CTX, or this CXA finalize um, is a func function whose job it is to call all the all the um, destructors that were registered through the add exit function. So finalize is one such, uh, one such uh, destructor. Um, so that gets called, that calls fine, um, cleans up all the, do, does a bunch of deallocation and cleanup. Um, in practice, it doesn't really do much. Um, the next part is there is this cleanup function, um, which could use a more descriptive name. Um, so what it actually is, is it's a function that's called only if a, um, a C file object was used during, during the course of the program, and it's used to flush out any remaining I.O. And then finally, we call the exit system call. So, okay, now dynamic libraries. So, here's a different trace. Um, what you might notice is that you can't see where main is. Um, main is this little bit on the far, far right. Um, <laughs> so, for those in the recording, it's a little bit over here. Um, so, dynamic library, dynamic linking has quite a lot of overhead. Um, and there's also a few changes in the process layout. So, the first, so we'll start here at the beginning. Um, this is the same memory layout that you saw before. You see the program on the left, you see the stack on the right. Um, and that's, the kernel loads the program just the same way, except that it also loads the runtime linker. Um, the runtime linker um, and the other, the other difference in the, in the exec, in exec V is that it jumps into the runtime linker's entry point rather than into the program. Um, the first thing the runtime linker does is it calls this long name, which as you can tell, it's just, if you look at it, you'll notice it includes relocate self. Um, that's because the uh, runtime linker is position independent code um, and it needs to be, have its variables updated um, and be relocated. So it, it has a bit of slightly horrible code that makes sure that wherever the heck the kernel decided to put it, it can run. Huh? Uh, it's C, it's not. It's at least C, it walks an array, it does some things. It's not, you know, it's not a big pile of assembly or something. Um, so once that's run and, and the program is relocated, um, it starts parsing the program itself. Um, it notices that the program depends on libc. So it loads libc and it does an initial relocation of libc, sets up all the global variables, um, and then sets up a table of um, of entry points for each, for the program to call into the symbols it needs. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Um, so we have, let's see, we have libc linked. Yes, so libc is now, now loaded in. Um, one, one thing about the, about RTLD is the kernel loads it um, as though it were loaded by, by the mmap call, which maps a file in. So it, it pick, attempts to pick the same location um, in the kernel. Not, that seems sort of gratuitously pedantic, uh, but that's what the kernel currently does. Um, one thing I did notice when I was doing my initial tracing is that the location it chooses is very poorly aligned. Um, and so it made it very hard to understand what the runtime linker was doing when I was look, so looking at an object dump file and looking at disassembly, because everything was shifted in fairly low bits. Um, so. In CherryBSD, I've moved it um, so it's aligned at 16 megs or something, and it's much easier to do math in my head. Um, and then libc gets mapped via mmap the normal way um, at the end. So then, so once libc has been initially relocated, um, we call into start again. So you can see way, way, way off to the right. Um, and this, um, I think, looks fairly familiar. Um, 
you know, you have main here. Um, the stack trace is a little screwed up because I didn't get my tool fixed in time. Um, so add exit does exit. Um, and it's not part of the stack forever. Um, but what you might, what you'll notice here is that there are these RTLD bind starts um, after things like printf, um, which has this funny name. So let's, let's take a look at that. So what you see here is that printf has this, this long name, which is printf and then at at this FBSD09. That says that this is, it's looking for version 1.0 of the printf symbol. Um, it's looking for somebody to supply that, in this case, libc. Um, that's in the symbol versioning mechanism, which, which is why we haven't bump, had to bump the version of libc since FreeBSD 7, which means your programs keep working, um, unless they do something like use libkvm or lib, libutil, which are hard to version. Um, so there's the symbol, and then when calls are made between modules in a dynamically linked program, they def by default, what gets called is this, this little bit of runtime linker code, rather than, so, so the symbol's not, not pre-resolved. This is because libc has a gazillion symbols, and they take a fair bit of time to resolve um, and, and, and to look up. So it'd be, a, it'd be very expensive on program start if we took all several thousand symbols um, and started them up, you know. As you, you, know, you see here, the whole runtime you know, there's maybe room for 20 of them in that total runtime. So you wouldn't want to make, do all these resolutions. So you call this little assembly stub here, and its job is to say, oh, you're calling, you're looking for printf. Um, so it goes in and it uh, wanders around in the libc symbol table, does a bunch of lookups, finally finds the symbol. Um, and then it returns and it sets up the table. So now the table includes the correct address of the symbol. Um, so feature calls, not that anything calls anything twice in this program, um, would, uh, will go direct rather than having this lookup occur. It's called uh, lazy binding. So that's basically the same. Otherwise, the program is the same. It's just that any time there's a cross-module call, there's one of these lookups. Otherwise, dynamic, dynamic for def is, or dynamic hello world is, is pretty much the same. So that is the end of my talk as I show you. I'd happy to take questions. Um, I would like to request that you give me feedback either by email or this is a link to the uh, conference website that's anonymous as far as I know um, and the QR codes for that too. Um, so let me know, um, was the talk helpful or interesting? Um, did it make sense? Um, what would you like to learn more about? Maybe you wanted to learn about J.A. Malloc. Um, maybe there was something you wanted to learn less about. Um, something that was dreary and boring. Um, this is a big messy thing. Some of it's kind of that way. Um, so I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Yes. Um, you talked about costing the argument to resolve the address space to the address space. Mm -hmm. Um, so let's see. Um, so the, the question is how does the how does the argument copying from the, the initial process into the kernel and then back out yes. work? So yeah, so that that allocate arguments. Let me pull up the zoomable F SVG. Whoops, I'll turn the internet back on. They were sending me messages, please. Okay, so the bit. So exec the copy in args. Um, it allocates some kernel storage. So it looks at the argument list and allocates some storage in the kernel um, and copies in all the strings. Um, you know, using using the usual copy in primitive. Um, and then after the address space is reset, oops, um, the uh, where did it 
So after the address space is reset, um, the, there is a stack. And that's, that's already mapped. That's just anonymous pages with the stack flag, which says they grow down rather than up. Um, this uses the optimization. And then exec copy out strings' his job is to take those things we've copied in and have destroyed in the parent process um, and to copy them out. And it, so it knows that whole layout, so it knows PS strings is at the top, and it sort of works its way down just copying out um, through the usual copy out mechanism. Um, yeah, that's true. Um, so I think it could. I don't know. Um, it, it doesn't get the book system done. You have to copy it out. You have to pull it out of the post and go to the DM to get approval with the target. Yeah. So, yeah, you, you probably could, in fact, do that. It would make the setup more complicated. Um, well, I mean, this is quite a bit. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think the copy out is very expensive. You don't lose very often. Um, but I mean, I think you certainly could do it. The the problem is that you would end up. You would want to change the structure of um, copy out strings. Um, to it would have to compute how much it needed. So you'd have to move who was responsible for creating the stack, which would be fine. So you'd have to change that, and then you'd have to have something that determined how big that set of strings was going to be. Um, and then, um, it's more than that, though. It's it's a bunch of ABI specific things. Um, so you could, I think, if you reordered everything a fair bit, you could do it. And I think part of the problem right now is there's quite a bit of pluggability. So, um, so. Exec copy out strings is the default for the architecture, but different ABIs have different ones. So you could do it, but you'd have to refactor all of the compat layers. So it'd be an interesting experiment to see if you got better performance or enough better performance to, to deal with the overhead. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, sure, I got one over here. I'll take you. What is in PS strings? Um, well, let's go take a look. I think I remember the name. There we are. Yeah, so it is, it's a pointer to one or more argument strings and it and to the environment. It's used to update. So it's it's primarily used, for instance, when you call set proc title to change the name of the program, you then need to point to a potentially completely new um, malloced um, set of arguments. It's a little gratuitous in that, um, at least for for the arguments, because you also call the kernel and say, please set this. Um, historically, at least, um, this was, it was done this way so that there wouldn't, so you wouldn't have to allow the kernel to, or the kernel wouldn't have to accept an arbitrary, arbitrarily large title. Um, in practice, there doesn't seem to be an actual limit on the syscall that's, or the, on the um, sysctl that's used to set it. So in practice, I don't think it matters. Um, so in Cherry ABI, I think I'm getting rid of this because it, the interface has a bunch of other problems. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, so it's, it's just pointers to these once they've changed um, so the debugger can find them. Um, part of why I say it's a bit gratuitous is that you could simply pass the same stuff to the kernel because you only really care about it if um, you're writing out a cord up or doing some debugging. So if the kernel knows where these things are, it's fine, it can write an elf note in the core dump and you can look it up there rather than sticking it at the top of the stack and hoping no one steps on it. You had another question. Um, 
Um, so what, what am I going to kick off the stack in Cherry BSD? Um, in, in Cherry ABI, which is the, um, the, the alternate mode where all pointers are, are hardware pointer, hardware protected capability pointers. Um, so what I, I am planning to evict everything from the stack. Um, none of this stuff has any relation to the program stack. So I'm going to kick it all off. Right now I'm currently writing it to that memory allocation because um, I guess to the, for the reason that I said, you know, it'd be harder to change, there would be a bunch of work to change how things are done. It's easier to just splat it to the stack. And then I actually restrict the stack pointer so the stack doesn't include that stuff. Um, the, the pointer that's actually accessible to the program doesn't include any of those things. Um, so I plan to kick all that stuff off, basically. Um, and eventually it'll just go somewhere else. Um, so yeah, auxiliary args should go. Um, and I don't want, I don't really want them to be accessible um, from the rest of the program. So I don't want there to be a global to access them. I want you to have to get them through the runtime linker, um, which will be able to compartmentalize. Um, so the runtime linker can become a trusted linker and loader. Um, I thought about changing the way we found PS strings, but Caustic really didn't like it, so we're not doing that. Um, what else are we doing? Um, not a whole lot of the ABI stuff. Um, I guess we are, I think, so on Cherry ABI, the way we find all those auxiliary arguments and stuff is there is a structure that's the interface between the kernel and user space. So we pass a pointer, instead of passing a pointer to the top of the stack, we pass a pointer to a structure that has an argv pointer and an argc and an nv pointer. Um, did, did we end up doing that for armv8? Okay. Sorry? So I think some of that disassociation should just be done. Um, and there's, there's actually no reason any of this should be at the top of the stack. It's just where it is. Um, so, um, but for the most part, the big, the big change with Cherry AVI is going to be that you don't have things next to each other that you can access, access one from the other. Um, that's not valid C um, and is something we can we can prevent, so we need to actually actually pass proper pointers to things, rather than uh, um, just knowing that things are next to each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then it occurs in the uh, exit code. Yeah. So let's see. Let's go back. Um, yeah, it's the cleanup. The cleanup routine does the flush in that case. So, um, way down here, there we are. <laughs> so yeah, way, way, way off at the end, the end of exit. Because you have ever done any I/O on that file descriptor, or attempted to do any I/O on a file descriptor, or perhaps a buffered file descriptor, the cleanup routine is registered, and therefore, it does the work. So that's why you get the silly interview questions um, with you know multiple outputs and stuff. Is Um, it walks the descriptor array and I think flushes things that are, that have, have data buffered. Yes. So yeah, it calls it, says, is there anything to do? Well, thank you all for coming.